How's it going, man? Oh, it's going, dude. It's going. Um, how long are you wanting this to be? That's the question. Oh, dude, it doesn't Either. matter to me. Just as long as you want. But um, we got a, Olivia and I are. There's a fundraiser people that are coming by our house. Yeah. To take a picture of us, and we're giving them like a bunch of canned goods for like homeless people at like three fifteen. Okay. Um, do you think that that'll be a long enough podcast, or do we need to put, do it right after? No, good. We're good to go. Okay, let's do it. We'll make it work. Can you hear Finn in the background? No. Good. Are you streaming like, uh, is the audio in your AirPods and everything? Yeah, it is. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, bro, I just wanted to, I think with a lot that's going on lately, like with COVID-19 and everything, and just people are trying to get their bearings straight, um, I haven't seen a lot of division, but I have seen kind of just a couple people make some remarks that I don't know if like people are able to address these things properly, but I just wanted to ask you like as someone who's, you know, been studying at Southern Seminary um, and just, you know, being familiar with church leadership, um, I wanted to present to you this sort of thought about people canceling church services, moving them to online, Mm -hmm. uh, streaming them and everything, keeping people at their homes. And then for the, uh, the smaller house churches and them still getting together and what that looks like. And just kind of like, what do you think, what do you think is the right thing to do? Because I think, uh, I've heard some people say that, uh, you know, bigger churches are acting out of fear or uh, yeah. house churches aren't being wise about telling people to stay home, and so on and so forth. So I'm just kind of curious to know your thoughts about all that. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm not a medical professional, uh, but at the same time, I, you do want to um, abide by what the recommendations is, because at, at the end of the day, yeah, the coronavirus is giving us, uh, you know, flu-like symptoms. It's no. Some people are saying it's no worse than the flu. Others are saying it's it's 10 times worse than the flu, worse than Ebola, worse than H1N1. Uh, And I think that you got to find the happy medium there. One thing that we do know is that this virus is highly, highly infectious. Mm. And so, um, uh, you know, it's just from the research that I've done from watching Fox news and CNN and reading things on Washington post, doing my own research um, that, that video you sent me of, um, ben Shapiro and um, you know the guy that was on there with Joe Rogan and so I think that one thing that we've got to recognize as a country is that this this thing is serious you know it's not something you know literally <clears throat> two months ago it was a meme and now it's like smacked us in the face you know seriously and so and so what does that mean for the church I think the church definitely needs to um, not live in fear. Um, but definitely does need to live in faith. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, God has given us a brain of logic. Um, and, um, and with that logic, um, comes, um, knowledge, I would think. And the, and the knowledge is, is that, um, you, you could be asymptomatic for four to five days up to, up to seven to 10 days Mm -hmm. and continuing to be passing this virus along. Uh, and you thinking you're perfectly fine. Um, and you give it to two, three, four, five people. Um, and then those people give it to those people. And I mean, you could single handedly take out a mega church in less than two weeks, right. you know, and, and, and make Kentucky an epicenter worse than Seattle and mm-hmm. Washington and New York state. And so, um, I definitely think, um, the bigger churches, um, uh, I admire what is Southeast has done. I've watched from a distance. Uh, I think that what they did was right. And they were actually the first that I saw uh, in Kentucky to to make a call like that, which they are the largest church in Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, in, in my own area in, in Paducah, um, it took some time for Heartland to actually, uh, which is where I go to church, uh, but it took uh, some time for them to actually make that call. Yeah. Um, and and uh, <clears throat> so I think Southeast made it on Wednesday and uh, conversation after conversation with some of the leaders within the church the elders prayed about it after they met on Wednesday. And mm-hmm. I think in the back of their mind, they knew that they needed to cancel. Uh, and then it didn't come until I think Friday night or Saturday morning um, that, Hey, we're, we're going to move everything to online. Heartland has about 26, 2700 members. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we average, I can't, I'm just throwing numbers out now. 
uh, we average a good amount of people in, in Paducah to come on a Sunday morning. Yeah. And so um, <clears throat> I definitely think it's wise uh, because some, some people, you, you don't know where they're coming from. Mm. You know, you don't want Paducah to be an epicenter. Um, and so I think it was definitely wise for them to do that. Um, and, and I think um, it's a, also a blessing that um, they're canceling. Um, um, one being, when was the last time that you've seen pastors, um, lay leaders have this many weeks off with their families yeah. on a Sunday morning? You know, yeah. you have senior pastors who are able to record a sermon on Friday or Saturday night, come home and watch that sermon with their kids and their family and then have a colloquial discussion after that with their families. Yeah. You know, it's a, uh, it's something unique and something different and something that uh, I think is, is beautiful for the mm-hmm. season that we're in. Um, <clears throat> I, for one, am miss, miss the church, miss going to church, miss hugging on the people that I love and, yeah. and Olivia is the same. Um, and so what does that mean for the smaller churches? I think some of the smaller churches, um, this has been taking a huge financial hit to them. Uh, at the end of the day, I mean, church churches are businesses too. You know, they're a 501c3. Um, they're fully funded by their members. And, uh, I think some small churches probably didn't have that, you know, emergency fund in there, or maybe, um, or was, was kind of like some Americans living paycheck to paycheck, which is fine. Yeah. Um, and, and some church plants are that way as well. Um, and so I think they, it took them some time to close the doors, um, and, and go fully online. Um, I don't know of many churches here in Paducah that um, are still meeting. Uh, we had um, one in Murray, actually, um, that continued to meet despite Andy Bashir's recommendations. Yeah. And um, come to find out that person was a visitor from, uh, I think, that anyway, a visitor came mm-hmm. um, and spread the virus within Murray. Um, and those people had to quarantine themselves for about two weeks. Yeah. And so you just, you just don't know, you really don't. And, um, I understand the hesitation. Um, I'm not in full-time ministry right now, but I did and, and did see behind the scenes of the financials and, yeah. you know, um, the day-to-day operations. Um, it is a, um, a difficult time for them because, um, you know, some churches, um, need millions a week. Some need 50, 60, 70,000 a week to stay afloat. Yeah. Some only need 10, less than 10,000 to stay afloat. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that money is coming from older generations who um, don't know how to give online. They're calling their grandkids, asking them, hey, how do I give online or how yeah, do I do yeah, this? Yeah. Or they don't have a paycheck coming in right now and um, they don't have any money to give. Yeah. And so... I think right now um, the church is being stretched, um, not only in large mega churches, but small churches are also being stretched um, tremendously. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's a beautiful thing, you know, to see families um, getting back to their original intent of, of uh, the family mold of, you know, discipleship in the home, because yeah. that's literally what is happening. Yeah. And so um, <clears throat> I think it's a beautiful thing, but at the same time, I want to, I want it to end because I miss the people that I'm around yeah. and I know the financial strain that it's having not only on a lot of churches around, you know, my area, but all around the country right now. Um, and, and I think it's sad to say, I think some churches will probably have to close their doors because of this, just like businesses, Yeah, you know? And so, um, this, this epidemic is causing shock waves, not only to, um, the secular world, but also to the religious world as well. So, so what would you say then to the leadership of people who can't stream online and are smaller churches, maybe not house churches, but churches of a population of 100 to 200 people? Because it's if that's their way of life and that's, you know, basically they're shepherding that, that family, how, how do they continue to do that? Or are they going to have to really bite the bullet on that? Yeah, Um Man, that's a difficult question. You know, I've I have solely gone to quote unquote a mega church my entire life. Mm-hmm. Um, Heartland's not to the magnitude of Southeast, but um, I think it's over two thousand is considered a mega church, and mm-hmm. so we barely breached that that threshold there. But um, um, I've never really attended a church under five hundred people. 
Yeah. And so, um, but if I was pastoring um, a church of that size, um, I would do my best to post something on Sunday morning, whether it be my sermon, mm -hmm. uh, record it in my study, record it at the church, um, and post it. And I think a lot of churches are doing that now, but the people who, like, say the older generations that, you know, can't do that. Yeah. Um, it's not that they can't. They just don't know how. Right, <laughs> you know, exactly. they're the... They're the, they're the people that are calling us and saying, hey, camera on, how do you turn my computer on? You know, those yeah. are the guys yeah. that really seriously need some help right now. And I think um, uh, for those congregations, I think it's a it, it would be um, kind of a humbling thing for them to have to call, you know, another church to say, hey, I need to get this out to my uh, my congregation. Can you help me record this or can I stream your um, I invite my members to stream yours right. or whatever. I mean, um, I think gone are the days of being territorial right. uh, of, of your members. I think they need to get some type of substance, um, whether it be from um, their favorite pastor or it be their own local church. They need to have some type of exegetical preaching. They need to have some type of expository preaching. Mm -hmm. um, they need to be worshiping at home. Um, and that's convicting to me um, because being at home is very difficult. Yeah. Um, because you have all kinds of distractions. Um, I remember last week I was kind of convicted about it, but last week um, was my wife's birthday mm -hmm. and I was cooking her birthday breakfast yeah. at the same time that we were worshiping. And so we were sitting there eating our breakfast while we were watching it. We weren't worshiping. And so yeah. it kind of, I, I got a little convicted about that a couple of days later, but yeah. um, <clears throat> I definitely think there's a lot of distractions and trying to eliminate those distractions at home mm -hmm. is difficult, um, especially when you've got a one-year-old and you've got, you know, or whatever the circumstance circumstance is. So. Yeah. So now, like in the midst of all this quarantine and everything, you know, we we've got quarantine kind of officially slash unofficially going on here for the next two weeks to see if we can really subside this whole pandemic. But what would you say would be the green light for churches to get going again? Should we adhere to like what the government's saying or should we, do we need to be a little bit more cautious or do we just kind of need to go with what's on our hearts here? Uh, truthfully, I mean, this is probably not a common thought process in a lot of, in a lot of areas and mm -hmm. especially in Christianity, but um, I would say keep the doors closed as much as possible. Yeah. Um, and, and not only just to protect your community, uh, but to protect your loved ones. I mean, the people who are most vulnerable are the older generation. Yeah. And once those doors open, they're going to flood. Yeah. Um, they, they are those people that will feel obligated. Well, um, the, my church doors are open. I must yeah. go. Um, there and are so as doctors that are even saying that that will cause a second wave in the epidemic for that very reason. For yeah. A pandemic, and, excuse me. Yeah. And so, I just think, I mean, um, I was talking to, uh, or Olivia was talking to Rusty Banks not too long ago, and they, they actually closed their, their, their doors before Heartland did, and he, he made a very good point. He said, I've got, we've got um, older generation guys up in their 60s, 70s, 80s years old teaching Sunday school classes for their generation or for younger generations, and if they open the doors, then they will feel obligated to come to teach their class to give them the substance that they need for Sunday school. Yeah. Um, and that's a very good. That's a very good point because I mean you've got so many lay leaders that are up in age because of wisdom and life and experiences and time being there. And um, I mean, I'm, truthfully, I'm just going to say it right now, whenever Heartland doors open, I mean, Olivia and I are going to be there. Yeah. And I think not only not only us, but every person that has missed it because you, you crave it, you crave community. And that craving doesn't stop, you know, just with that generation. It's every yeah. generation craves that community. And so uh, I think you definitely need to adhere to the um, to the rules. Uh, I wouldn't say rules were the recommendations by President Trump. Um the uh, the coronavirus task force, um, especially um, Andy Bashir. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Andy has done a freaking fantastic job. Um, I think he's been a little overboard in some things. Yeah. Um, but he's trying to protect Kentucky, and uh, I respect that tremendously. And so I think I think as a religious community, um, you know, we've got to abide by that so that we don't have um, this second wave, like what's going on in Hong Kong right now. 
um, they, they opened the doors a little too quickly and yeah. now they're having this second wave of coronavirus. And so, um, I think our government's doing the right thing. Um, it's going to kill, it's going to kill the economy. Yeah. Um, but I definitely think for the sake of American lives, like it needs to be done. So, yeah. um, I wanted to shift gear a little bit in, uh, since you lead a Bible study, how big is the Bible study that you lead approximately? <laughs> it's college students, man. Um, I mean, college students, I love them to death. They're about as flippant as it comes. Yeah. And, um, but I'd say, um, anywhere it can be from 10 to at the highest 25 to 30. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a very come and go, uh, type of Bible study. It's more of a community group. Yeah. Um, it's not tied to, uh, you know, a local church. It's more of a local community of college students coming together. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's kind of a beautiful thing, but and yeah, it's a pause button on that for right now too. We have, um, uh, we're actually conducting, uh, we're doing a Passover study right now. Uh, and we were actually going to do the Seder together. It's something that we've done. I mean, we did it in Louisville with you and yep. it's a very beautiful thing. And now we're doing this huge in-depth study, um, with, um, these people who are, um, I would consider former Messianic Jews. Now they're kind of more Christianized than anything, but they have, basically spent their life studying on Passover, the festivals, the feasts, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And so they're teaching us right now um, to lead us up to the Seder. Mm-hmm. And um, it's gotten to the point where we're probably going to have to postpone the Seder yeah. um, just because we'll have more than 10, 10 or more people um, gathered to to, pre- to, um, to do that feast. And yeah. so, um, but right now we're doing everything over Zoom. Um, I mean, last week uh, on Tuesday, I think we had, 11 people call in yeah. on the zoom, um, including the four that were at my house. And so, which was family members. Um, so it was, it's, uh, it's interesting. I'm glad that we're able to do that. And technology is allowing us to do that. So what do you think the American church should do about Easter Sunday coming up? Yeah, dude. Um, <clears throat> wow. Um, I mean, single handedly Easter Sunday is probably one of the most important, um, events in um in christianity Mm -hmm. but at the same time um every sunday is just as important as easter sunday yeah you know um yes it's a holiday um yes it's a huge event um celebrating the resurrection of our lord um but that should be something that's done every sunday you know Um, there's no different there's nothing different than an easter sunday than there is to every other sunday and um um I'm going to be anxious to see how some churches respond to it. Yeah. But if this quarantine extends past it, I'd say that it probably continue, needs to continue on to be an online type thing. Yeah. I think um, it could be a cool thing that if churches could um, offer maybe like a, a communion, um, like a, not like a drive through communion, but some type of communion where you come and get your materials and then whenever – you know, we do this, we can all do it together from the, you know, the places of our homes. I think that could be a very beautiful thing. Um, knowing that there are thousands upon thousands of people, um, doing communion, but they're not in the same place. Um, I think that could be a beautiful thing. Um, and then celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. Like I said, I think that that's, that needs to happen every, every Sunday. Um, but I don't know. I'm not, I don't have to make those decisions. I'm not in full-time ministry. Um, that is a question that I'll probably have a conversation with our senior senior pastors. Um, yeah. I uh, I'd love to see what their answer is, and I think that they would probably say the same thing um, that they if it does extend that they're I have to figure something out. What so. would you What would you say to the to people who are saying, "Well, if we don't do this, then we're accepting defeat"? Like, I, I can just see somebody saying that we're that we're right. being cowards or we're being faithless. Yeah. Or like, what would what would leadership or be response be for that? Yeah, listen, suffering's been going on for thousands, thousands of years, and I think right now the church is suffering in many, many ways. Um, um, and and I think it's not like a, a suffering that the American government's putting on, like boo Christians. I don't think that that's the case. Yeah, it's for protection. Um, but like I said, suffering's been going on for a long time. I don't think that we'll be accepting defeat. I think we'll be using our brains. Yeah. Um, and I, and. Um, the people who are saying that are people who probably feel like they have to do something for the Lord to gain, you know, grace or mercy or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, 
they might not have a right understanding of, of, of grace or might not have a right understanding of the gospel. Mm-hmm. I don't think that we'll be um, um, considered defeated. I think that we definitely will um, be, um, I don't know, I, that's kind of, it's kind of weird, yeah. you know, to kind of think about, but I, I don't think that you'll, you'll be defeated by that. And I think, I, like you said, there's going to be people who are going to be saying that and are going to be disappointed that if those, those events are canceled. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. at the end of the day, um, Easter's not, uh, I mean, truthfully, we've got to accept that the church is not a building. Right. And I think that that's what's going on right now. Yeah. Is that not only the older generation, but our generation, the generation below us, the many generations that are alive right now are accepting the fact that the church is not a building. Yeah. It's a global church from Hong Kong to LA. It's a global church. And we are all experiencing the same turmoil and the same suffering at mm-hmm. the same time. Yeah. I can't remember the last time the church was experiencing the same suffering at the same time, yeah. not only in my lifetime, but if you look back at the history, when was the last time that the church was experiencing that? Well, it was right after Jesus resurrected, yep. you know, um, and all these Christians were being persecuted, killed, martyred. Mm-hmm. Like that was the last time this stuff was happening. And so um, now Christians aren't being martyred for their faith. But I think that suffering on a global standpoint for the church is happening right now. Yep. And so um, – I don't, I don't know. Which maybe the Lord's that, com- maybe the Lord's coming back. Who knows? <laughs> that's actually is what gonna I'm gonna segue right into that. That brings me to my next question: Has anyone asked you if we are in the end times at all, or what do you think the uh, the severe events going on? Because it's not just that it's not just coronavirus. Because if you notice, like Australia was on fire. There are billions of, uh, there's literally 30 billion locusts consuming all the crops in Africa right now. Like, right. There are multiple things across the world happening. And I actually, I'll see if I can pull this verse up, but I'll let, I'll just hand it off to you and you can tell me what, like, your response would be for someone who's curious to know if, if we're entering the end times here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I mean, I've thought about it. Um, I actually haven't had somebody directly ask me that. Um, I mean, I've seen it on Facebook and Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, before the coronavirus even came around, you have grandmas and great aunts sharing on Facebook that the end times are coming because Donald Trump was elected, you know? (laughs) So, uh, um, but uh, I've always held to the stance that right after, um, right after, the Lord resurrected and he ascended into heaven. I think the end times began there. Um, I think the church has been suffering yeah. for 2000 years. Um, I mean, listen, if we look back into history, um, I think the end times are, um, people getting martyred for this, their faith being fried alive, being burned alive. I mean, these are a couple hundred years after Jesus ascended. Yeah. And, um, I think, I think the end, we are living in the end times. Absolutely. We are. Yeah. Um, but the, when is that season going to, you know, end? I think that that's when the Lord comes back, but, um, I don't think that there's a definite, definite timeline of saying, Oh, the end times begin here. We're going to have seven years of tribulation. Then we're going to have X amount of days and we're going to have this, we're going to have that. Um, I just don't truthfully, when it comes to end time stuff and revelation, I love the book. I respect the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but I jokingly tell people I'm a pan millennialist, um, yeah. that it's all going to pan out for me because I'm a Christian. <laughs> Um, but, um, I mean, I don't get into the pre and post and millennialism yeah. and all that kind of stuff. I just, I just don't, because I don't want to, I don't, not saying I want to waste my time trying to figure that stuff out, but mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's more of, there are so many beautiful caveats and beautiful things to unpack, not only in the new Testament, the old Testament, and yeah. really just glean the wisdom that there is rather than me trying to figure out, you know, when's the old times or the end times going to end and begin. It just doesn't, it doesn't, you know, uh, tickle my fancy to do that. I just yeah. don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, but th- to say that we're in the end times, I think that, that I would tell that person if they asked me directly, like, I feel like we've been in the end times for 2020 years, yeah. you know, um, ever since or 2000 and however many years, less than that actually since Jesus was born. But, um, anyway, yeah. that, that would be my answer. Would there so, be anything like that you would read in revelation that would strike you as similar to like, what we're observing around us or is it still just kind of like, ah, we haven't seen anything yet. Um, man, it's been some time since I've read revelation. Um, so 
I don't, I don't really, I don't really know. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I definitely think when you look at the revelation, I think the, the birth, death and resurrection story of Jesus is told yeah. numerous times rather than just once. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know some people who think that the revelation, like there's literally going to be a, you know, multiple headed serpent, with somebody on top of it coming out of the, out of the sea um, and the harlot, all that they, they believe very literally. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you look at the original language, you can see that very figuratively that John is speaking with a figurative speech. Right, this right, is a metaphor right. for something. Right. Um, I know that some people say, well, that could be a patchy helicopter or it could be this, it could be that. Yeah. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know. The Lord could say right now in the middle of this podcast, all right, son, go get him. Like, yeah. and I'd be like, praise God for that. You know, um, or it could be another 5,000 years. Who knows? Yeah. But, uh, I definitely think that we're living in the end times and I don't, I, I mean, without me looking at revelation right now to specifically answer that question, yeah. Um, I don't know. I really don't. Um, it's definitely worth me looking into and trying to decipher that. So I, I don't know. Cool. I'm well, actually going to look into that. I'll probably text you that later and be like, I found something. <laughs> we'll talk more about it later for sure. But, uh, all right. Final, uh, final question here. Would you, okay. w- what would be, uh, what comments can you give to, uh, the congregation right now on, how we should be behaving during this time and what advice would you give? That'll be pretty much it. Yeah. Um, truthfully, since this all began, um, I have purposely tried to stay off social media. Mm-hmm. Um, just because, um, everything that is posted has to do with COVID-19. Um, everything yeah. from believer to atheist, um, they have something to do with the quarantine. They have something to do with homeschooling their children. They have um, something to do with, you know, I'm out of toilet paper and all these kind of things. And uh, then you have people who are very positive about this. Like I'm getting back to be able to have dinner with my family. I'm, um, I'm taking away phones and we're able to have meaningful conversations. Yeah. And then you have the opposite end of people that's begging the school systems to take their children. Um, because they hate every single second of it. And, um, and so, um, for me, uh, like I said, I've tried to stay off social media just so that I don't skew my view on some people. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's already been some people that I'm like, Whoa, never yeah. thought that you were that type of person yeah. or that you would say something like that. Um, and so I think as the church, uh, we definitely need to, um, really give grace, uh, and for some people, um, give mercy, um, extend love, uh, and in a lot of areas, uh, to some people, um, and, uh, and to reach out to some people. I've had, um, some, some guys that I used to hang out with, uh, love them dearly. I don't know if you remember the Heine boys, but they FaceTime. Yeah. They FaceTime me uh, a couple days ago and I was talking with them back and forth. Haven't seen them for like four weeks. They're church members at Heartland. Um, Long story short, I was talking with her dad, Kyle, and uh, they do something that was beautiful, I think was fantastic, um, to continue to have some type of sense of community. They would FaceTime someone every single night before they would have a family movie night. Um, and so however long that they would FaceTime someone, um, then that next person, whether it be mom, dad, or one of the boys getting to pick a movie, and they would all watch it together. Um, I thought that that was really cool, you know? Um, so you have, you have families that are really, um, um, loving this time and really making most of the time. And then you have some people that just, that just aren't. So to encourage people, I mean, my absolute favorite verse, um, in all of scripture is, um, uh, Philippians four, six through seven. You hear me quote this all the time. You're probably going to start laughing, but cause I quote it all the time, but it says, be anxious for nothing. Um, but in everything with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your request known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and minds Christ Jesus. The first thing that the Lord or that Paul says here is, um, be anxious for nothing. And I think in this time, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of uncertainties. There's a lot of people not making money. There's a lot of people not being able to provide for their family. 
Um, I definitely think that now is the time to cast your cares before the Lord and really glean on the Lord and don't waste this time. Yeah. Um, I definitely think that that I need to take a step back and actually listen to what I just said. Um, because, um, I think that a lot of time could be wasted on, on Netflix and on Amazon prime and, and trying to distance myself from the realities of the world that's going on around me. Um, and so I think a lot of people really need to just cast their cares to the Lord. And what does Paul say next in everything by prayer and supplication? Yeah. He doesn't say just sit around and mope. He says, give, cast your cares to the Lord, um, pray to the Lord, um, give thanks to the Lord for this season. Like how in the world can some people ask to give thanks in a season like this? Yeah. Um, be thankful that you're getting time with your kids, your mom, your dad, whoever, yeah. um, time off for, for, you know, looking inside yourself. Um, and, and then it finally, it says in the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension will guard your heart and mind Christ Jesus. And so I definitely think whenever you're doing those things, especially in a time like this, in a season of worry and doubt and uncertainty, um, I think that, uh, the Lord really begins to prune people in seasons like this yeah. and begins to show them and chisel away sinful things, um, and, and really show, um, the meaning of life um, and, and and the validity of things that you are really spending your time on now really don't matter, you know, in the end. So um, to encourage people, um, I would say continue to love on your kids, love on your family, um, love on friends. Um, don't, don't be that person that says, I'm going to, well, I'm going to social distance myself enough and I'm going to shut myself in my closet and not come out for eight weeks. Right. Continue to continue to meet with people. If it's over FaceTime, if you're going out, going for a walk with a friend, um, obviously if they're showing symptoms of COVID-19, get away from them. But yeah. um, <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, I definitely think that we as a we as a nation don't need to say, well, it's time for me to be an introvert um, yeah. and, or it's time for me to be an extrovert. I think there's a healthy balance in that. I think there's a healthy balance in some people really reaching out to others because there's a lot of people that are extremely lonely right now. And... Um, uh, you, we need to reach out to those people. Yeah. So cool, man. encourage people to love, to love on people. So absolutely. Well, cool, man. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. I yeah, said, dude. Uh, yeah. It's a good deal. Yeah. I, I always enjoy coming on chit chat with the old George Shadburn. We got to do it so, more often, man. Oh, yeah. dude, you've got the, you've got the setup going on here. I mean, I'm in Paducah. You're in the Ville. We and, can make this happen almost regularly now. Dude, I, you know, every Friday at two. You yeah. know, I mean, <laughs> we'll call it the we'll I'm call just, it the looper segment or something like that. There, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see, yeah. What, we'll so, see what knowledge you have to melt people's minds. That's right. That's right. Well, um, I, I you know I listen to your podcast fairly regularly, and you're the one always asking questions to people. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that I thought about would be really cool for your listeners is um, how could your listeners be praying for you right now in this season? Um, and how could your listeners be loving on you in this season of time? Man, good question. Um, I guess, uh, you know, I would just ask the listeners to pray for, um, pray for my discipline and my diligence to keep, you know, pushing through because, Mm -hmm. um, I'm definitely not above the circumstances that are happening to everybody else too. You know, like my, yeah. My work life has been affected. My finances have been affected, but I want to I want to stay true to what God's calling me to and and the passion that he's laid before me, which is this podcast, you know, just to to bring awareness and and perspective and education to people on these subjects that I just really feel like um bring a lot of value and a lot of just spiritual growth to people's lives. I I want to be able to mm-hmm. stick to that while I'm still trying to um, maintain my resourcefulness to to be responsible to what I've committed to, you know. So, uh, yeah, everything's kind of a coin toss right now. I'm I'm able to stay with it and stay diligent, but I would just ask that uh, anybody that listens just pray for me and just pray that the Lord um, brings the support in that's necessary for me to continue doing this because um, I am just passionate about you know everything that's going on and I. I want it, yeah. I want people to be able to connect with this stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Well, yeah. I hope I hope that people take that to the heart, you know. And um, you know, Olivia and I are praying for you always. And so, love you, man, and 
love your yeah, man, your family that. and all that. So, um, yeah, man. but anyway, thanks, thanks for having me, bro. Absolutely. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll talk to y'all later. See ya. See you, dude.